Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zias Caravalo from ZK Research, and I'm here on site in Dallas at the Extreme Connect 2024 event. I'm here with my friend Bob Liberté, who is now with the Cube Research. Absolutely. Thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah. So, uh, Bob, you and I have done a number of these uh, together. I think uh, we haven't done a live one in a while, though. So this is our in-person one. So this would be kind of good. Uh, yeah. Now, uh, we've both been to a lot of different Extreme events. Uh, uh, this is the near the end of day two. So we saw the announcements, the keynotes, heard a bunch of customer stories. Uh, just overall impressions of the event. So overall, <coughs> I think you know, oversubscribed event. Lots of energy, yeah. lots of end users here coming to, to learn and find out about what's going on with Extreme. And I think one of the, you know, the big takeaways for me, it's been great to see, you know, a lot of the previous ones have been about integrating the new companies that they had bought. Yes, and now, of which there were many. Correct, there, yeah, were, there yeah. were several that they've had to yeah. digest and bring together. They've done a nice job of that. And now we see that shift of accelerating the innovation on technology to enable customers, whether that be for outdoor Wi-Fi, whether it be for AI or security. Yeah, what what I really, my takeaway from there, this is, you know, Extreme, it's still relatively small when you look at the other networking vendors, uh, but it's got a, a very impressive customer base. That, right, and you, you, you look at a lot of their customers, their big universities, all the, all the sports things, obviously. Uh, you know, the, uh, Ed Meyercord this morning in their keynote talked about Korean Airlines, Correct. and uh, and they, uh, I think, the fabric technology in particular is fairly is unique to them. Nobody else right. really offers SPB based fabrics. Right, and all um, the way out to the branch. As yeah, well. so yeah, and uh, in some ways, they are a bit of a industry secret still, right? And um, and I think part of it is just the the fabric is. Because it is unique, they're the only vendor that really adopted that standard. Um, it's not something right. that you know everybody knows, and there's a competitive bid. Uh, in fact, even when talking to some of the extreme execs, they often have to convince their customers to try it, right. and then when they do, they never they never actually lose the customer. But the customers that use it tend to like it. And so this, you know, uh, I often judge a company based on its customer loyalty, and extreme tends to have a fairly high uh, level of that. So yeah, I think the other interesting thing was it. What came out from all of the customer examples that they were giving is that the, the forward-looking companies are working with Extreme. Yeah. People who are looking to the future are looking to leverage that, that fabric technology and so forth, right? Now potentially some of the AI capabilities and things like that that they're doing as well, but certainly they've got an eye on how do we enable organizations to move forward. Yeah, and so this is their user show, right? And so all these user shows always have a certain level of news tied to it. Yeah. And so let's talk about the news. So day one news, was about Wi-Fi. Uh, they have their little certificate now for uh, AFC, and, the, and uh, they're able to uh, light up uh, Wi-Fi 60 outdoors. Outdoors. And uh, how significant do you think that is? Well, I think it's really what the, the most significant part of it for me is the fact that they've been shipping outdoor-capable yeah. solutions, right? So weather-resistant, you know, weather-resistant boxes and so forth, able to turn it on. So now they've got thousands of ports that they can just simply turn on. So with the AFC approved, it now enables them to go out there and do it. Now, the question, they still need to go through the, the hoops of AFC, right? You're making sure there's no other incumbent nearby so they can turn it on or which frequencies they can turn on. But I think that's a huge step forward that a lot of people have been waiting for. And the great part is if you're an extreme customer, you now get to take advantage of that as soon as that approval comes through portal. Yeah, I'm curious to see who's going to be the first. I know they've had a handful of deployments to uh, a couple of them won awards here, right? Yep. Uh, Cedar Fair, yep. um, yeah, San Francisco Parks. Giants, and, and Oracle Stadiums. Park. Yeah. Uh, and I remember those press releases. They're very careful in their wording to say, wording to say, why, why uh, 6E, outdoor 6E capable, capable. so they right. can turn it on in outdoor areas. But that is something that, um, uh, with the clean six gigahertz spectrum, um, I, I was talking to Dave Coleman about this. What kind of speeds can people expect? And, and he saw even in just normal usage you know, two, three, four gigs sometimes, right? Yep. And so um, I, I think that takes Wi-Fi, because Wi-Fi 6, for the most part, if you got two, 300 gig or meg, right. I think that was good. Correct. Right, but now we're talking about gig gigabit speeds. Correct. And uh, Correct. Uh, I think that's going to allow companies to provide a whole new level of digital services. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, and for the outdoor spaces, yeah. which, is, which is fantastic. As well. Yeah, well, there's more and more Wi-Fi outdoors. Now, what do you think this does to the wired network, do you think we see a network refresh here? Yeah, I think if, if people have not already upgraded to Wi-Fi 6E or to 7, I think we're going to see uh, a wired upgrade 
I'll take it, right? So they have more yeah. power, but tri-band radios and things like that. I think another driver for upgrading that will be a lot of the PoE stuff, right? You see a lot of lighting, yeah. shades, things like that shifting to it. So I think there's a lot of interesting areas where organizations are reimagining how they use the network. So not only just for pure connectivity, but also to power a lot of what they're doing and things like that. So. Yeah, I'm curious to see how the vendor community adapts to this too. Uh, that's something else uh, Dave Pullman and I talked about. He said they're working on some stuff, but when you think of the increased power that's required to light up these APs, right. um, and then you go to Europe where they've got mandates on cutting power, uh, I think the industry as a whole needs to think about how to manage power better, right? So Correct. still leaving these things on all the time, can you shut them off? Yeah, and I think uh, that's what yeah. David had said. They're, yeah. Stream is looking at how do we put things into sleep mode. So yeah. very much like those automated lights that come on when you go into a room and go off, doing the same thing for the access points so that organizations can leverage this capability and greater throughput, but also potentially reduce the amount of power that Yeah, so they may, uh, uh, you may have to spend some money to save some money. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Now, what if for, for customers that are using um, you know, Wi-Fi 4 or 5, and there's still a lot of 4 out there. Um, do you think they should go to 6E or 7? Do you have a preference of those two? Or yeah. is just 6 gigahertz in general good enough? I, I think getting to 6 gigahertz is yeah. a big, big jump, right? So when a lot of people are talking about the two and should I wait for 7, I don't think you should wait for 7. I think you should jump in on, on yeah. 6E if, if you haven't, right? But now, if, you, if you're still waiting for a refresh, I think the hard part's going to be, you know, if you jump to seven right away, it's going to be a while before there's seven devices, devices yeah, that yeah. are going to be available. And then so, eight might be out, so. Co correct, yeah. so yeah, and, and like I said, a lot of seven was consumer grade, active, right, things if you're gaming and yeah. insight and things like that. So it really comes down to the business and what you're using it for, but I think either one would be a great option to get into that six. Yeah, I right. do think though that you're going to start seeing some gaming-like things in businesses, VR headsets. Um, I know all the collaboration vendors are working on VR-based collaboration Correct. and things, and so, you know, who knows, you might see that. So, uh, anyways, day two news was around AI. Well, oh. also, don't forget Universal's ETNA. Oh, that's right, one. yeah. So, also, so connectivity, security, and, and AI were the three themes of yeah. the show. So, the Universal's ETNA enables organizations to have a single unified policy through the networking device for the NAC and for ZTNA for connection. And who do you think their target audience is for? They're obviously extreme customers, but yeah. is it a strong enough ZTNA product to go sell it to networks, to security pros, right? And that's, that's where I question. I don't think they'll have any problems selling it to their existing customer base, going right. through the network manager. It's where now you start you know, button up against the other ZTNA vendors and who's got control of that. Yeah, I think it's, in a, it's also, so it's going to be interesting to see based on the size of the company and how well established or entrenched yeah. the security and network teams and who Ottery, who controls it today. But from a, just a pure operational efficiency to be able to eliminate potentially two other vendors and yeah. be able to consolidate that and have some operational efficiency, I think that's going to be attractive to extreme customers. Yeah, well clearly the, uh, I guess the network security uh, battle is on, right? All the network, all the network vendors want to be more security, and all the security sure. vendors want more networking. And so, somewhere along the line, companies are going to have to make a choice, and they want their core competency to be networking that enables security, or security that enables networking. And I don't think yeah. there's a right answer for that right now. No, I think people are still <coughs> trying to figure that out. And, and like most things that happen in our space, the technology is advancing quickly, but the cultural aspects are going to be harder to overcome. Right, the fiefdoms yeah. of security and networking and who controls it, who controls the budget, those will be the bigger issues that need to be resolved as that, as that consolidates. Yeah, and, and even a lot of the vendors uh, that try and unify it, they're not really unified either. So, uh, yeah. you know, I guess, you know, the, the battle lines are still being drawn here. Absolutely. All right, so now yeah. let's get to the AI now news. Let's get to AI. Because it's been, I don't know, a few minutes and we haven't talked about AI yet, so we're, <laughs> we're way late on that. AI, AI, yeah. AI. Yeah. And uh, so they announced Copilot a couple years ago, and they, they talked this morning in the keynote, they demoed their generative AI yes. use cases, although when they did ask for a show of hands of people that were thinking about it, very few people put up their hand. When they said, who's tried ChatGPT, most people put up their hand. So clearly Correct. people are experimenting with AI. From, what, from the conversations you've had with customers, obviously there's a lot of interest in AI, but how many are actually using it in production for AI ops? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think from what I've seen in a lot of the research that I've done, organizations want to be able to have that intelligence to provide alerts, right? Don't give me the alarm storm, just give me one alert or a couple alerts that I can that I can. The solve. right alerts. Yeah, the right alerts. And then the other piece is that we see even more so than that is 
you know, the majority of organizations want that intelligence to give them an alert and a recommendation. So I'm really busy. My network space has gotten much bigger, far more distributed, more complex. So help me operate more efficiently because I don't, the, the rate at which my network is expanding doesn't coincide with the rate in which my network team's expanding. Yes. So I need to be able to do more with less. And so that ability to get an alert and a recommendation on what to do, I think dramatically reduces the, you know, and it, it enables, we all talk about this evolution of going from reactive to proactive. Being able to have that type of information can enable that transition and enable fewer people to cover a much larger, more distributed, more complex environment. Yeah, I think um, with AI in particular, when you think of the normal hockey stick adoption of technology, I think we're going to have an elongated blade, but then when the adoption starts, I think that'll be pretty quick. And I think this just comes down to trust. Do you trust the yep. system to do what they're supposed to do? Yep. And, uh, yeah, you know, I know, um, you know, I've gone through this myself with AI-based technologies. I've got a, a AI-based radar on my bike that tells me where cars are. And at first, every time it beeped, I looked behind me. Yeah. And now I, I don't because I know it's you exactly started right. Yeah, after 10 times of looking back over your yeah. shoulder, you yeah. know Then where, you believe where it. And, it I, and I think for, it's, um, it's a lot of faith to put in the systems, especially for your company network. I mean, the network power is a lot of stuff. Correct. And so if it's wrong, um, there's a certain downside to that. But I do think where we'll get to is engineers will start to understand that my environment is so complicated today that me having to sort of check everything just acts as a bottleneck. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's going to be a progression between AI and automation. So getting those alerts and recommendations yeah. are a great use case today that doesn't impact, the, right? They still have full yeah. control over what they do. And then there'll be that easy button that allows them to automate certain things. So I think when you see that shift to automation, it'll come on a use case by use case. What things have I gotten comfortable? And I think the other big piece of this, and, and you know, Nabil did a nice job of talking about you know, bringing in the humanity, bringing in people into this discussion around AI. And I think their closed loop system that they have is going to be really important for organizations yeah. to become comfortable with it. So they can You're get, talking about being able to give feedback. Right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Being able, that feedback loop. So being able to be sold, here's, here's the alert, here's the recommendation, and then your ability to provide feedback and say this was good or it wasn't. And I think that's critical, especially because so many of the network you know, operators that are so experienced are starting to yeah. age out. So making yeah. sure that they're participating in this, a, this shift to AI and being able to validate what's going on, I think is going to be a real critical part of the AI adoption. Uh, yeah, I, I, think, I think that's true because it'll help build the trust. It'll build the trust yeah. and it shows, and, it just, and it's also you're able to think about if you said, how would you like to test this product with some of the world's smartest network yeah. operators, right? And so. I think they're also, Taking a, they're, t they're, take, they're obviously taking an ecosystem approach, and they had Intel yeah. and Microsoft on the panel. And yeah. one of the things they didn't really overtly state, though, is they're actually pulling information off the Intel NIC. Correct. Right? And they, Correct. that That's wasn't obvious point. to the audience, mm -mm. but I think the more of that kind of third-party data they can bring in, that creates some interesting analytics. And they've had, they, they have a very good analytics product. Correct. Um, but I, I don't think they really, I, I think that a lot of people miss that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, yeah. and that gives the, it, the differentiation there and why that's important is it not only gives the top down from the network down, but it gives you the user up. Yeah. All right. So being able to have that 360 view of what's going on, yeah, it's obviously absolutely going to yeah. drive some improvement. All right, Bob, well, sum this up for me. You think about they've got a good product line, right? They, they are obviously a leader in Wi-Fi. They're in a lot of yep. tough deployments. They are in an industry, though, with a lot of big companies. Correct. Right? And so... You know, when you look ahead for them, um, I guess they're, we need to think of them as the kind of almost a disruptor here, right? Well, yeah, they, yeah. they, they have, obviously they're going to try and take advantage of some of the uncertainty in the industry with some of the big acquisitions going yeah. on with, with a couple of the vendors. But I think, you know, what they need to push forward with is the technology they have, right? Recognizing that the rate of their innovation is really starting to accelerate, yeah. especially around AI, around some of the security things with Wi-Fi. Um, and what's most intriguing is that, like I said, they're the organization that seems to be working with the forward-looking companies. And so, you know, being able to drive that, that adoption yeah. for people for what comes next. And I think, you know, the, the, state, of, the state of Texas, the CIO said it yeah. adaptly. She said, I have a, a forward-looking strategy, right? And yes. I need to work with other companies that are, that are also forward-looking. So I think that was reflected in the Living for Tomorrow piece that we saw. Yeah where they came in and really, you know, they are clearly concerned about 
working with organizations that are thinking about what comes next. Yeah, and, I, and personally what I'm expecting from them is to step on the gas for product innovation. I think yeah. they've been, um, uh, you know, a, a little spotty in the past on with product rollouts, but I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that they, were, they had to roll up Aerohive, Motorola, you know, uh, Avaya. Avaya, Brocade, yep. and Terrasis, Terrasis Extreme, right? All those different products, but all that work is done. Correct. Right, and so now they have one product the, line. The foundation is laid, yeah. right, it's set, it's and, ready to go. And they've taken Extreme IQ and they've made it cloud native. Correct. Right, so they can drive more features into that faster because, you know, as long as it's an on-prem product, it's hard to, to do that with. And so now, from an engineering perspective, all that complexity is out of the way, Correct. and now it just comes down to execution. Yeah, so yeah. That's, that's what it's really all about. All right, so I think both of us, uh, more than positive experience at Extreme Connect 2024. Absolutely. So, all right, anything else you want to add? No, I'm good. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So on behalf of Bob Liberty, I'm ZS Care Valve from ZK Research, and thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on the next episode of ZCast.